our physical reality is a shadow of a larger reality. And I was blown away when I first saw that because that's exactly what the Bible's been saying all along. We have all been trained in Euclidean geometry, three-dimensional worlds. Einstein made scientific history by recognizing that we really live in four dimensions by adding time to the mix. Time is a physical property. We know that we live in at least 10, that's the current uh, uh, dimensions. Four of them are directly, uh, uh, we can experience them. But we know there are six others that we can't get at directly, but we know they, we, by, we can infer their existence mathematically. What makes that provocative to people who have discovered that is that a Hebrew sage by the name of Nachmanides, back in the 13th century, uh, predicted that from studying the text of Genesis. He concluded that our universe has ten dimensions, only four are knowable, to use his term, and six are not knowable to us. And I find that fascinating because we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides did by studying the text. So the ten, some say eleven, there's some debates among mathematicians about details, but there's awareness within the advanced scientific community that, there, that we live in more than just the four dimensions that we directly experience. If we take those things that are larger than us, larger than man's reach, and just lump that and call that the macrocosm, we suddenly are confronting astronomy, astrophysics, those kinds of things. The great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite. It may be expanding, but it's finite. And that has staggering implications. That means it has a beginning, and it'll ultimately have an end. And that's what gives rise to these conjectures that go under the label of the Big Bang theories. There's four of them. Uh, none of them quite satisfactory, but that's the, the common conjecture, if you will. The point being, that's, that's an acknowledgment of the fact that we're dealing with a finite universe that had an origin. But the fact that it's finite is my point at the moment. If we go the other way, looking at what's smaller than man, call that the microcosm, that gets even weirder because you and I would think that if we took, say, a, a length, a piece of string or something, and we cut it in half, we'd take whatever we have left and cut it, in, cut it in half again. And at least, maybe not physically, but conceptually, you think we could, whatever we have left, we could cut in half. It turns out, we discover, shockingly, that when you get 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and you try to divide that, what we have there loses a property called locality. And that, that there's, a, there's a term in physics of, 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 of a, a, a characteristic called locality. And th that observation has actually been proven in the laboratory. Um, in 1987, they actually demonstrated non-locality. Every photon in the universe somehow is directly connected to every other photon. And uh, that defies our normal thinking of space, if you will. But the point I'm getting at is, we live in our, what we call physical reality has a limit in smallness. And we call it the Planck wall because whether it's length, mass, energy, or time, there's the, it's made up of units that you can't divide. So there's a limit to smallness. There's a limit to largeness. So we, what we discover we're in, we're, what we call physical reality, is a digital simulation. And uh, there was an article in Scientific American, June of 2005, which was dealing primarily with the fact that constants in physics seem to be changing. But they make the observation that's profound, that if the, physics, the constants of physics are changing, that implies that our physical reality is a shadow of a larger reality. And I was blown away when I first saw that, because that's exactly what the Bible's been saying all along. And, uh, so that, that leads to a conjecture that the universe created with ten dimensions, something occurred to restrict us to the four that we experience. Many of us, because of passages in the Bible, uh, Romans 8, and, uh, that in Genesis 3, when God declares war because of the fall of man, the creation was made subject to the bondage of decay, the entropy laws and all of that, apparently were part, somehow tied to, God's curse on the cre everything we know about the creation is post curse. Prior to the curse, it may have had ten dimensions, and for some, it was fractionated. So that some of us tend to regard those six inaccessible dimensions as the domain of things like angels, the domain of paranormal behavior, 
And it's our suspicion that the UFOs somehow are trafficking from those dimensions into ours. And that it turns out that if you try to speak about dimensions more than three or four, the average person can't relate with, to it without special training. There are only two people that really relate to that. That's spe mathematicians with special training or small children. And so, but what we can learn a lot about dimensionality by going the other way. You and I are three-dimensional beings. Imagine if we had a two-dimensional universe, a piece of paper or, or a flat plane. We could put, imagine at least two-dimensional beings in there. If we had two of those, getting from one to the other by them would be unthinkable. But we as a third dimensional being could pick them up and move them over. To them a miracle has happened beyond their understanding. If I as a three dimensional being put my finger through their two dimensional world, they wouldn't see my finger. They'd see a, a thing that was a ring and then it would shrink. As I, when it, or if a, if a ball passed through, it would appear as a dot that would become a ring. In other words, it only would be seeing the intersection of that three dimensional thing with their two dimensional world. So we begin to get some feeling for dimension. Another example, if I have two beings there in that two-dimensional world, I could put my finger a millionth of an inch away from each of them, no matter where they are. I can enjoy greater intimacy with each of them than they can with each other. So we suddenly read the whole concept of an additional dimension starts to we get a feeling for what that might mean. The evening of the resurrection, they were gathered in a room, frightened, doors were locked, uh, six-sided space, four walls, a floor and a ceiling. They're there, nervous. And who shows up right in the middle but Jesus himself? At first, they're frightened, naturally, uh, confused, thinking maybe he's a spirit or something, and he challenges them. He says, handle me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. So he, in his resurrection body, has some peculiar properties. Because he apparently, obviously, has the ability to enter and leave a six-sided space without passing through the six sides. And, and a mathematician can deal with it. There's ways of mathematically dealing with that. To a mathematician that's skilled here, he would argue that it would take at least 11 dimensions to do that the way it seems to be described. Fine, whatever it is, it is. John, in his first letter, in chapter 3, verse 2, makes an interesting remark. It says, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we, sh we shall know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What I hear that saying is that we will enjoy the same dimension dimensionality he has. If I show you a picture of me, I'm showing you a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that's more comprehensive. We shall see him as, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So that gives us a glimpse of what the resurrection body that the Bible talks about deals with. But again, see, we're going into what, what would be called uh, technically a hyperspace, more than three dimensions. And that's not easy to do with. I spend more of my time, as I try to promote the Bible in various contexts, um, I spend most of my time undoing the effects of bad science. Most of what we're taught in college, not just high schools, is not true. Astronomy is obsessed with gravity, and if you get outside the solar system itself, gravity becomes a non-player. The plasma physicists have been trying to tell us that for years, no one's listening. So that's why we did Beyond Newton as our, we went into all of that. The electric sky, the fact that the, when you get out to galaxies, you're talking about electrical behavior, not gravitational behavior. The astronomy world hasn't discovered that, because gravity's instinctive, Maxwell's, the Max, James Clark Maxwell equations are not instinctive. They're very, it, it takes very special study. They, they behave very different. And that's what uh, David Bohm got so, coming out of the plasma world, became so fascinated with. And he's the one that predicted at least the possibility that the universe may be really some kind of super hologram. And now they're beginning to get some suggestive evidence that that may be true. But again, uh, the scientific community continually, uh, well, I should put it the other way, our educational establishment continues to feed the kids stuff that is just not true. The nebular hypothesis is the birth of the planets. Provably not true, and yet it's still taught at the college level. If you take a course in astronomy, you'll get exposed to the so-called nebular hypothesis. 
And not that it's shreddable. It's mathematically imp impossible. Uh, you've got 99% of the mass is in the sun, and yet 99% of the angular momentum in the planets. How do you get there? You, it turns out you can't. They were brought here. And, our pro and what's so interesting, as we learn more on, of good science, it's converging to the very image the Bible tells in the first place. The four dimensions that Einstein discovered are listed in Ephesians 3.18. And you could go on and on, example after example, the zero point energy, some of the most advanced concepts in the field of, of uh, 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 astrophysics are in the Bible, but just not recognized because of the, that disjuncture.